poker players. I know a lot of people don't necessarily think about how do I crush passive poker players. They're very concerned with how do they crush the, the loose, splashy, battling poker players. They don't necessarily consider how to take advantage of the players who are just kind of hanging out. But those players are at your table very often. They don't necessarily stand out, but you can win a ton of money from them. I, I, Jonathan Little, used to sit at 1020 No Limit Texas Hold'em at Bellagio. Every day, I would show up at about 11 a.m., I'd get in the game at about 11.30, and it would be me and a bunch of passive poker players. And I would crush them. Nice, easy game, no risk, no pressure. Just hang out and crush the nits. Let's discuss how to do that right now. In order to cr crush the passive poker players and poker players in general, you have to exploit what they are doing wrong. Understand that playing fundamentally sound poker will help you win consistently. But when you take advantage of your opponent's mistakes, you will win huge. Most people are far too lazy or have too big of an ego to work on how to optimize their strategy against weak players because they just don't necessarily think about them. They just think they're going to automatically win. They expect the chips just to flow their direction. And, you know, to be fair, maybe they will a little bit. But I want them to flow in your direction quickly. In this webinar, you're going to learn preflop strategies to crush passive players. Also, my number one exploit for continuation betting and also how to demolish these players on the river. Are you ready? Let's get started. Thanks to all of you for being here. If you're here, click the like and subscribe button. We are live. Well, I guess if you're here live, we're live. Anyway, tip number one, raise way more in late position. Are we talking cash game or tournament? Both. Understand that the exploits to take advantage of, of specific types of players apply in basically all forms of poker. To some extent, this applies to Potlum at Omaha. The players who have giant flaws in their game are exploitable in all poker variants. Take a second, think about this. Raise way more often in late position. You think that applies in cash games or tournaments? Or both? Obviously both. With weak players yet to act, when you're, say, in the cutoff or the button, you should widen your range substantially. Okay? These players are not going to three-bet you often enough, and they're not going to fight hard enough for pots. So your preflop fold equity goes way up, and you can steal these players' blinds consistently. That said, I want to make it very, very clear. You get to raise wider from late position, Okay? You do not get to raise a whole lot wider from early position if the players yet to act are kind of weak and tight and straightforward. You get to raise a little bit wider, but not a whole lot wider, okay? Especially when stacks are deep. You really, really, really want to focus on playing lots of times from in position. Seems like a lot of you want to talk about limpers, people who limp every hand. People who limp every hand, I suppose, are passive. And some of you are saying, if you raise the limpers, they're going to call every time. Well, hey, is it a problem for you to go in position against one limper and you know that they have 65% of hands minus the top 15%? Is that a problem for you? Especially if they're going to check fold a lot on the flop. Not really. It's actually a great scenario for you because they're going to call a lot pre-flop and then check fold when they miss on the flop. Life is easy. Okay. That said, that's not the exploit we're talking about here. We're talking about the situation where they fold around to you. You're in late position. This is a spot where you need to be raising way wider than most people do. By the way, when people do limp with decently wide ranges, you can't just raise any two cards. It does not work like that. You have to be at least somewhat reasonable. Once people have indicated they have something, in those scenarios, you have to start to play way more reasonably because it's not like they have the 8-4 offsuit or something, right? All right. Let's take a look at these two ranges in particular because that is exactly what we are discussing right here. Whenever you are discussing poker, you need to discuss specifics. A lot of people like to talk in hypotheticals or you think that one scenario definitively applies to the other scenario, but you want to make sure we know exactly what we're talking about, especially when we're looking at specific ranges, okay? So right here, we are talking 80 big blinds deep, cutoff, raise first in range. We're talking about this one here. This means everyone folds around to you in the cutoff. Here is what the GTO strategy recommends raising. As you can see, all the hands in red raise, hands in gray are not raising. But 
if the players on the button, small blind and big blind, do not call quite enough preflop and they fold a little bit too much, or they don't call enough preflop and also they do not three bet enough preflop, this is a spot where you get to raise wider. So how much wider? Well, it depends on how weak and tight your opponents are. If they're just like a tiny bit too weak and tight, you can raise a little bit wider. Maybe stuff like all the queen nines or all these hands that are using mixed frequencies. Stuff like 6-4 suited, 4-3 suited, 9-8 offsuit, king-8 offsuit, ace-4 offsuit, sure. If they're super duper weak and tight, I'm not going to say you can raise as wide as you normally could on the button, but somewhere between these two ranges to the point where you're raising like queen-2 suited, king-7 offsuit, any ace-x offsuit, 8-7 offsuit, etc. So you get to raise a little bit wider. From the button, if everyone folds to you, as you see, you're already raising pretty wide. This is something like 55-ish percent of hands. You may think, wow, I can't raise much wider than this, but you can. If the players in the blinds are weak and tight, you can definitely raise 9-4 suited, 8-4 suited, 7-3 suited, queen-7 offsuit, jack-7 offsuit, 7-6 offsuit, 6-5 offsuit, king-4 offsuit. These are all hands that become very reasonable to raise if you do not expect to get three bet all that often. Now, obviously, that's the scenario we're discussing. We're not discussing the spot where you expect to get three bet a lot. Then you may even want to tighten up a little bit, but that's not the spot we're talking about. We're talking about when we have weak, tight, passive players yet to act. Maybe not even tight, just passive. They just don't three bet enough. You have to realize one of the worst things that can happen to you when you are playing poker is to get raised and have to fold. Because when you fold, whatever equity you has, has, I'm bad at English, English is my third language, please forgive me. Whatever equity you have whenever you get three bet and you fold, all goes to your opponent. So if you raise the 6-3 suited preflop and your opponent three bets you and you fold, well, maybe you had 30% equity, 35% equity, 40% equity, who knows, against your opponent's range, and they take it all. That's a disaster. So you really don't want to get three bet. If your opponent's not going to three bet, you get to raise wider because you're going to realize your equity far better. Should you be raising middle pairs, suited connectors? Why does everybody want to talk about limpers today? We have plenty of videos discussing how to crush limpers on this YouTube channel and in pokercoaching.com. That's not the situation we are discussing. Please head over and watch those videos as soon as we are done today. This webinar is going to be saved. All videos we do here live are saved to YouTube forever until YouTube goes down. Hopefully no time soon. Anyway, when they fold to you in late position, you need to raise wider. Here are the GTO ranges. Most people on the button don't even raise this wide, playing 80 or so big blinds deep. To be fair, some people raise 100%, which is also too wide, but you know, you should be raising a little bit wider. You definitely wanna make sure you are raising wide enough though. A lot of people think they're supposed to just play good, strong hands, and uh, that's, that's a problem. You make money off of passive players because they fold a little bit too often and they don't re-raise quite often enough. Exploit number two. This is a very profitable spot. You want a continuation bet small and often, specifically with your bluffs. Now, this is an extremely exploitative strategy, but until a weak player proves otherwise, third language problem again, force them to fight back against your small continuation bets. Now, most people who are weak and a little bit passive, they're going to call preflop and then just check full when they don't have anything and you're gonna crush them. If you have watched a lot of the GTO strategies we discussed on this channel going through PioSolver, we actually did one just the other day in my morning show at 9 a.m. Eastern time, a little poker. We went through a bunch of spots and you saw how aggressively your opponents have to defend against small continuation bets. Again, go back and watch that if you wanna go see some common spots. Your opponent needs to be calling and or raising a lot against small bets and most people do not do that anywhere near often enough. You probably don't. I have a difficult time with it. Whatever you check and your opponent bets 20% pot, you have to defend a ton and you have to raise a ton and most people simply don't do it. So you want to bet often and small, okay? Also, exploitatively, you may want to bet bigger with your value hands because if your opponent has something, they're not going to fold and it's probably pretty good. So with your hands that crush their hands that are pretty good, it may be fine just to bet big, hoping they have one of them, right? And if they have nothing, well, they're going to fold to any bets. You might as well bet tiny and save money when they happen to have it when you are bluffing. So when you have junk or a thinish protection slash value bet, go small. 
Remember, these players will not check raise or check call often enough. Obviously, if your opponent check raises or check calls a ton, this does not apply. All right. Let's take a look at a very common scenario. Folds around to us. We raise the 9-5 suited on the button. Obviously, this is fine. This is even in the GTO range. As you see here, 9-5 suited, very clear play. You should be raising this every time. If you look at this 9-5 suited and think, what are they doing? Raising the 9-5 suited, that's crazy. Good standard GTO poker. Also, worth noting, if your opponent's going to fold to minimum raises, you might as well raise minimum and save money when they happen to 3-bet you. Because if you raise 9-5 suited and they 3-bet you, you're going to fold. Big blind calls, one of these players. Flop comes, jack, 7-3. We have absolute nothing. This is not a board you can continuation bet 100% of the time in GTO world. With your absolute trash that has no potential really to improve, like this hand, you want to check fold. It's unfortunate, but with zip and pip, you got to get out of the way. However, against someone who is weak and tight and passive, just bet tiny. We bet 150 into the 550 pot. You may think, wow, that really is tiny. Yeah, your opponent's going to fold a ton. In this spot, if they fold when they don't have anything, I don't know the exact math here, but they probably fold, I don't know, 60% of the time, 55% of the time. That presumes they're calling with all gut shot straight draws. Okay? So if your opponent's going to be folding that often, just bet small. They're going to fold, and you move on. Obviously, don't go around showing your opponent your bluff or don't laugh at them or anything jerkish like that, right? Collect the pot, be happy with your great spot, and don't blow it up. Let's see what all of you are typing in the chat. Is 9-5 suited on the button with 100 blinds a fold? No! Absolutely not. You get to play wider as you get deeper, not tighter as you get deeper. I literally just showed you this chart. 80 big blinds on the button, raise first in, in a tournament. This does presume there's an ante in play and no rake. If there's an ante and a rake, you should probably play a little bit tighter. But again, you're exploiting the passive player. Remember, we are not trying to play GTO against someone who has huge flaws in their strategy. Anyway, in a tournament, I guess I should make this clear. As you get deeper, you get to play slightly wider. As you get shallower, you have to play tighter, just in general, from late position. So if you had 200 big blinds, you'd raise perhaps even wider than this in GTO world. Okay? What's a good bankroll for 2-5 no limit? Ooh, do I have the article for you. Check out pokercoaching.com slash bankroll. Very clearly listed there. Obviously, it depends on your win rate. If you're terrible, there is no adequate bankroll. If you're really, 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 really good and you're smashing your opponents, $15,000 may even be too much. One three requires an entirely different strategy. Nobody folds at low stakes. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I literally went and sat my butt in the chair at one three no limit hold'em at Borgata to write one of my books to get lots of experience playing against these players. A lot of these players folded far too often. Literally, this hand I just showed you came up all the time. Sure, people limped a lot of hands, but whenever they fold around you on the button and you raise and the big blind calls, they just check fold when they don't have anything. This is like the bread and butter spot where you just print money. Now, if you happen to have found a game where literally no one folds, they put it, they, they check call this flop with the queen two of clubs every single time, and then they just keep folding later, great. Queen two of clubs, maybe even supposed to defend against a super duper tiny bet. But... You get what I'm saying. If your opponents are going to call a queen two offsuit on the flop, great. What's wrong with that? Smash them. I'm happy for you if you found a game that, that's, that, that, that is that soft. Your bankroll is going to go through the roof quickly. You're going to be out of those games in no time. Very, very happy for you. You got to realize, games where your opponents are just really horrible don't actually exist all that much in 2023. And if you are lucky enough to find one of those, or perhaps skilled enough to find one of those, get in there, play a ton, and win at 20 big blinds per hour. I mean, great. You gotta realize, if you're winning 60 bucks an hour at 1-3, whoo, let's get out the calculator. You need almost no bankroll. You probably need like 6,000 bucks. You're gonna win $60 per hour, and obviously you're gonna play this game, what, 80 hours a week? Times 52 weeks a year? You're gonna make, oh my gosh, 250K a year? Yeah, 250K a year. Congratulations! Kim Huck, I am so happy for you. You just can't remember Poker Coaching Premium. Welcome! Hope you're learning a ton. If you can rebuy a lot, should that change your strategy? Not really. You got to realize just because you can rebuy does not mean you should rebuy. If the rebuys are free, that changes your strategy. Like if they're just included in the buy-in. What if you're in a position like a small blind? That's not what we're discussing today. 
Almost sounds like your game, LOL. Good, Scott, I'm happy for you. You often race eight big lines and players still call it ace-three offsuit. Fantastic, Tyrell. I'm glad you found this game. Literally, sit there. Play a ton. You'll make $249,000 a year. Obviously, you have to pay taxes and whatnot. After taxes, you start getting a pretty high tax bracket at that point. You're probably only actually pocketing 150 k after you pay taxes and whatnot. Obviously, you got to pay um, health insurance and all that stuff, too. So, you know, it's not like you're just pocketing 250 k a year. But you're going to win a ton of money if your opponents are atrociously terrible. Good job. All right. Anyway, against players who fold too often, continuation met frequently and small and exploitatively used the small size almost entirely as a bluff. 80 hours per week? What a deg. What's a deg? 80 hours per week is... I mean, look, you got to realize, if you find a great spot, your job is to sit in the chair and maximally exploit that spot. I screwed this up with sit and goes. Back in the day, whenever I was a kid, I only played about 60 hours a week whenever I was a young poker player. And I left a lot of money on the table. Some of my peers who realized that game was going to die, because how long can the party really last? They sat there and they played 80 hours a week or 100 hours a week. Now, to be fair, I studied a lot. I probably studied more than them. It set me up for success in the future. But some of these players grinded hard. So whenever I did move to Vegas and I started playing cash games at Bellagio, I played literally 80 hours a week, maybe more. How much did I play? Let's get the handy dandy calculator. I played 12 hours per day, 12 days, or 12 days per week, seven days per week, 84 hours per week I played. Now, I would quit early, maybe one day out of seven when the games were bad, when I was losing a blot, or the games were tough, whatever. So maybe I only played 80 hours a week. But let's say you do play 80 hours a week times 52 weeks a year. That is this many hours per year. I knew I was making about $120 per hour. Not too bad to sit there and play 510 No Limit Hold'em in a game it was relatively soft and passive and weak. Not too bad. Now, most people, of course, they don't want to make $500,000 per year, no risk. They instead want to go party on the weekends. They want to play only 20 hours per week. They think it's hard to sit there and play, honestly, kind of standard poker and not play horribly. But, you know, poker's not for everyone. And that's okay. That's okay. I'll take the money. I don't mind. All right. Number three. Stop paying your week passive, straightforward opponents off on the river. This is the biggest mistake I see from players, especially in small stakes cash games. They're against these players who literally do not bluff the river. Yet they have a hand that they think is a good bluff catcher. It's a strong hand. It's a good hand. But it loses to all the nuts. And your opponent, who does not bluff, when they check raise you on the river or they raise you on the river, they have the nuts. Understand, you have classified these players as weak, passive, and then you're sitting there on the river with a good bluff catcher and you get emotional and you talk yourself into calling because you have a good bluff catcher. And, you know, can they really be that bad to where they never bluff? The answer is yes. There are plenty of people who literally do not bluff the river, especially in small stakes games, because a lot of players in small stakes games want to know they are investing their money in a great spot. Okay? Understand that if your opponents do not bluff often enough, the right answer is to not to call a little bit less often. The answer is to stop calling with all of your bluff catchers. They are all negative EV and they should all fold. Pavel says we have a regular job and a family and you can barely play 40 hours a week. Well, look, I mean, hey, you have, pri- you have other priorities. I'm glad you have a job that makes more than 50 bucks an hour, 60 bucks an hour, whatever. That's good. That's a good spot to be in. Nothing wrong with that. Remember whenever I first met my wife, one of her mentors at her law firm was a super duper high stakes poker player on the side. He made a ton of money at his job as a super high up lawyer. And he made a ton of money playing poker on the side. Nothing wrong with that at all. Obviously, there's a lot of value in stability, getting a paycheck, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, of course, you need to know that you are crushing the game. Something tells me a lot of people here are not actually playing a ton and they're not actually crushing their game. They just want to complain about their opponents calling with ace-three offsuit and making three threes. And then they pay them off every time. Literally, I'm telling you the exploit right here. You all are killing me today. You are killing me today. They called with the ace three. They made three threes on the river. I bet and they raised me. How could I fold? How can you fold? You take your cards and put them in the muck. Is it better to play deeper against passive players? Um, it depends. Let's take a look. Queen nine offsuit. We raise it up. In a tournament, itty big blinds deep. Big blind calls, passive player. King nine seven. They check. 
We continuation bet, frequently in small, with a good but non-premium hand. We certainly don't mind if they fold out 10 high or whatever. They call, fine. Turns an eight, check, check. This eight is pretty bad for us because now 10, nine get, or jack 10 gets there, nine, eight gets there, eight, seven gets there, king eight gets there, king eight was already there. A lot gets there. On the river, they bet 7,000. Okay, look, in GTO world, call, maybe even bluff raise if you feel inclined with that beautiful queen of spades. But against a player who is weak and tight and passive, just fold. Just get out of the way. Just get out of the way. Tiger plays only with the Twitch Prime sub. Did you all know if you are a Amazon Prime member, you can go to Twitch and give any streamer you want $2.50 every single month for free. Otherwise, Amazon keeps it. Don't give it to me. Go give it to somebody else. We all appreciate it. Though. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate each and every one of you. You're mad that your passive opponent ends up playing a four bet pot with garbage. Um, I'm not sure if you read the topic down here. How to crush passive poker players. Passive poker players do not four bet with garbage. They do not three bet with garbage. You're playing limit hold'em. Today we're discussing no limit hold'em. Most of my um, content discusses limit hold'em because that is a game that is played in most major casinos. Not all, but major. So you focus on playing limit. I would not recommend anyone play limit in 2023. I think that would be not a great use of your time. However, if that's the only game available in your city and you're not moving, then uh, I guess, yeah, play limit. I mean, I don't know. You got to play the game that exists, right? That said, that game does not really exist elsewhere, at least on a large scale. You don't make money from soul reading weak type players and calling off on the river. That is correct. Random really wants to know, is it better to be 200 big blinds or 300 big blinds against passive players? It doesn't really matter. It's all super deep. You're not going to get 300 big blinds against a passive player anyway. You've lost a lot of money on the river calling against tight passive players. Yeah, a lot of people have. And I'm telling you, this is a great spot. This is a scenario where most people think, all right, easy call, and they call, and then they lose. I'm like, okay, they, they had me, whatever. But this is a seven big blind mistake. And I'm not going to say you're losing the entire seven big blinds because, you know, maybe they are bluffing. But this is a spot where if your opponent doesn't bluff and they bet big, you just got to fold. I think in general, most people don't even bet big on the river in this spot if they are weak and tight and passive without a pretty good hand. They think they're going to win. So if they think they're going to win... Well, they probably do. So fold. Is it a bad move to raise the river with the queen of spades? Probably. Now, if your opponent's going to fold everything besides a flush on the river, then maybe it does have merit because you do block sets, you do block two pair, you do block flush. Maybe it's reasonable. But again, at least in my experience, you don't really make a lot of money trying to bet your opponent off of a hand that they've announced is strong. Your opponent has announced... I like my hand a lot. Okay. What makes you all of a sudden decide now they like their hand a lot. This is the spot where I'm going to try to bluff them. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I think if your opponent bet 3,000 on the river, well, calling becomes way more viable with your nine, but also bluffing becomes a little bit more viable because then most people don't bet 3,000 on the river with flush or two pair or something. Is value in playing play money for practice? Not really, unless you do not know the rules. If you don't know the rules at all, I think play money is fine. But I think if at all possible, you want to play against players who are actually trying to win. Nick says, because of me, you're able to turn $0 into 129 grinding free rolls. Nice. There you go. There's merit if you can get paid if you win. All right, let's take a look at another example. Bucket fives. We raise it up in a tournament, 60 big blinds deep, big blind calls in the WPT main event recently. Opponent checks. We continuation bet. Nice spot to bet on the bigger side. This board is very dynamic. We discussed this thoroughly in the tournament masterclass and advanced tournament course. Opponent calls, turns a nine. They check. We're obviously going to bet again. Medium to big. We do bet medium. Maybe you can even go bigger here. I will say against a tight passive player, if they have a queen, they're just obviously not folding. So maybe we even want to go like 50K. Right. One thing about passive players is if they have something pretty good, they just don't let it go. So if they're just not going to let it go, then you might as well get more money in the pot. So maybe bigger is ideal. This is a spot where when you are playing live poker, you can to some extent look and tell that your opponent has it. 
if they have it, it, you know, it being a queen, if they have it, then, you know, bet bigger. Our opponent raises here. Are we going to fold? No. We're not trying to fold here. You're not trying to fold sets, typically. They call. Rivers of Ten of Spades and they check. Okay. Should we go for value? Take a second. Think about it. Do these players telegraph their hand strength with bet sizing on the river? Some do, some don't. Understand, all players are not the same. You're just getting back into poker after being away from 2014. Good, I'm glad to hear it. We do our best to help everyone here. Are we value betting or not on the river? Take a second, think about it. This is a trivially easy value bet. Non-humongous. You don't want to rip it all in. If you rip it all in, you're only going to get called by flushes and straights. But if we bet medium, if our opponent has a queen or two pair, they're definitely going to call. And the great thing about playing against passive players who don't bluff enough is that if we get check raised, we can easily ditch it. Matthew wants to bet 20 big blinds, 100K. I think 100K is probably a little bit big. You want to make a bet that can reasonably get called by a queen. That's what we're trying to get called by, right? You think you check here. You don't want to get check raised. You got to realize it doesn't matter if you get check raised. If your opponent literally check raises with exactly straights and flushes, who cares? Just fold, right? Life is easy. If your opponent's only going to check raise with straights and flushes. If they're going to check call with a queen and two pair, and they're going to check raise with straights and flushes, and they're not going to bluff you because this is a weak, tight, passive player. Remember, we have this read. This is not a generic player. This is a weak, tight, passive player. This is a great spot to value bet. Now, how big do we go? In GTO world, you should know, very definitively, the smallest size you use on the river in position is about half pot, which is about what we do here. Now, are we in GTO world? Maybe, maybe not. Will your opponent call half pot with a queen? That's the main question here. Will your opponent call half pot with a queen? I think probably. A lot of people don't like going around folding top pair. Remember, they called the flop, they called the turn, they could easily have a queen, right? Also, a lot of queens are going to have two pair. So I think it's a pretty good spot to go this size. The nice thing about betting this size too is that if your opponent does have two pair, they're probably not going to raise ever. But if you do bet smaller, like let's say, I don't know, 35K like some of you are recommending, they may decide to value raise with two pair at that point. They may put you on a weak hand because you bet so tiny or whatever. Um, when you are in position, by the way, uh, this is a spot where your smallest bet size is half pot in GTO world because you don't want to bet tiny because that does open you up to getting raised. You really, really, really don't want to get raised. You don't want to go for a small amount of value, but in exchange, getting raised some portion of the time. You want to be getting a large chunk of value. Um, typically on the river, you're going to have multiple bet sizes, but in position, the smallest is half pot. You could go big, like pot, or all in. And, uh, you know, exploitatively here, if I had the ace-high flush, I would strongly consider ripping it all in. And the reason for that is if the opponent does have a flush or a straight or maybe a set, they're going to pay you off. And you're going to take all their money. With this hand, though, especially with something like queen-10, I would be very inclined to go for closer to a half-pot bet because now I'm trying to get called by a relatively weak range. So anyway, we go 75k. Opponent puts it all in. Do you pay them off or not? Well, we've already discussed this. The answer is no. You may say, but if they know you're going to fold a set on the river, you should, of course, fold. I'm sorry, you should, of course, call because they're going to bluff you on the river every time. But you have to realize the weak, tight, passive players are not going to check, call, flop, check, call, turn, then all of a sudden they try to decide to check, shove the river in the middle or late levels of a WPT main event. They just don't do it. They're not sitting here until day two or three with the idea that I'm going to try to check raise all in on the river as a bluff. That's just not what they're doing. Okay? Well, now you fold. Yes, now we fold. And that's fine. We ran into it. You lose. It's okay. You are not going to win every single hand that you play, and that is okay. This is a spot, though, where a lot of people convince themselves, well, I have a set. How can I fold? And to be fair, I don't like folding sets. You all know me. I don't like folding at all. But this is a spot 
where it's just an easy fold. It's a trivially easy fold. When a weak, tight, passive player jams here, they have literally a flush. Can we beat a flush? Look at our cards. We cannot beat a flush, so we fold. We can't fold a set here, can we? Of course we can. It's a super easy fold. It's not even close. Queen 10, two pairs, the only value hand that we beat. I would be shocked if they jam Queen 10 here. I think actually a shove with Queen 10 would be quite terrible. I think it would be atrociously bad. Because you got to remember, we could have flushes. Right? Don't forget, we can have flushes. We would certainly bet the flop with the flush draw. We'd certainly bet the turn with the flush draw. We'd certainly bet the river with the flush draw. Right? Well, with the flush on the river. So they have to worry about us having the nuts. We could easily have the nuts. That's also something that's worth noting. Whenever you would play a lot of better hands in the same way, then you should be folding the bottom of your value range to some extent. Now, I did just say queen 10 is probably roughly near the bottom of our value range. Maybe queen 9, maybe queen 7, something like that. We need to have a pretty good hand to bet the flop and the turn and the river in this spot. So, in, even in GTO world, I think this is just a fold. An annoying spot. An annoying spot. You struggle to fold a set. Why do you struggle to fold a set? Because the set's good? Just because the set's good does not mean it's good whenever you bet the flop and the turn and the river, then your opponent checks shoves all in. Right? Hand values change as the action progresses. And they change a lot. Do we call with a bad flush on the river? I would hate it, but yes. That said, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe you fold. I'm not trying to fold two pair, though. I'm not, I'm not trying to fold a bad flush in the spot. I do think some players will take a hand like King Jack and shove it on the river. Not that it's good. Um, so, you know, maybe 7-6 suited is a fold. 7-6 of spades is a fold. That would feel bad. Now, look, I think this set's an easy fold. 7-6 of spades would be a much more difficult fold. I would have to be very, very confident in my read. I will say there's this idea of like confidence interval and how confident you are that your read is accurate. If you've played with your opponent for 18 minutes and they haven't played a hand, well, I'm certainly not folding a flush, right? If I've played with my opponent for 18 days and I've literally never seen them check raise river without the super nuts, then yeah, I'll fold. So, you know, depends on the scenario. Anyway, did we pay them off? Obviously not, we folded. We're not trying to lose all of our money. So that is it. Three tips to crush weak passive players. To recap, number one, raise more often in late position because if they're going to overfold, you're going to steal their blinds over and over. Next, continuation bets small and often with your bluffs until they prove that they are going to start defending their range reasonably. And number three, stop paying them off on the river. I know a lot of you in the chat today said that your opponents, some of them, play like this. And they beat you sometimes. And it's because whenever they do happen to make the nuts, they check raise the river, you call off with your set, and you're mad because you got unlucky. And well, that doesn't work out. You're loving the study sessions. Good if you're a poker coach. Remember, we have almost daily live study sessions at this point. The members are crushing it. We're actually having a summer sale right now where you can get 70% off of poker coaching standard and premium. If you join right now, you can absolutely transform your game with over 2,000 interactive poker hand quizzes. Kind of like what we did here. I would literally ask you, pre-flop, what do you do? Obviously, you raise. Flop, what do you do? I bet over half of you in this chat would have bet the wrong amount on the flop. This is a very common spot where most people bet small. But the right answer is to bet big. Okay? On the turn, how much do we bet? I bet a lot of you on the turn bet way too big, like pot, you're like blasting it. On the river, I bet a lot of you bet way too big, or you check it back. A lot of you literally told me you check it back. That would be a mistake. You got a value bet. You bet. You get raised. What do you do? Easy fold. A lot of you say, how can you fold a set? Well, set's not good when there's straight and flush available. So we have over 2,000 interactive quizzes like this where you can go through some spots that are somewhat standard, some spots that are a little bit difficult, some spots that are tricky, some that are exploitative, with all different stack depths, all sort of payout implications in tournaments and cash game structures, et cetera, et cetera. And it's going to go a long way to helping you transform your skills. You get instant feedback from my hand-selected world-class coaches. As you see, we have situations discussing you know specific spots like river scenarios, 
early in the tournament, various online tournaments, defending the big blind against the button, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We list the stack depth. We list how you do on various betting rounds so that you can figure out where you're screwing up. It's important to know where you are screwing up. Also, I'm excited to announce that we have a new tool that is available for all poker coaching members. This new tool provides you with a fun way and an interactive way to learn GTO preflop ranges without feeling like you have to memorize them. I know a lot of you have told me specifically that you have a difficult time figuring out which hands to raise in which scenarios. Going back to our PowerPoint here, you literally said in the chat, are you sure 9-5 suited is a raise on the button in a tournament? Yeah, I know because I've studied the chart. And we have made a way for you to learn the chart super duper easily. So we have our new clear the chart feature. With clear the charts, it's super easy. You're going to be able to test yourself and learn thousands of GTO preflop spots by essentially quizzing yourself over and over. First, number one, you choose your stack size. All right? Choose your stack size. Number two, choose your position. What position do you want to quiz yourself on? Next, choose the action. What happened? Are you raising first? Is there a raise in front of you? Are you did you raise and face a three bet? Did you raise and face a three bet all in, et cetera, et cetera? Choose the exact scenario you're in because like I said, you have to discuss specifics to some extent. Next, choose your opponent's position. So in this spot, we have lined up here. We're playing a tournament, 30 big blinds deep. We raise the cutoff. We get three bets against the button. What should we do? Then you play the hand in this spot. We raise from the cutoff, 30 big blinds deep. The button, three bets. Back around us. What do we do? All in, of course. All in is the preferred play 100% of the time. No mixed strategies here. And you just cleared the first hand. Okay? Then you can do it over and over and over again. The goal is to clear the entire chart. Get them all right with five or fewer mistakes. Here's another one. We raise from the cutoff. Get three bet from the button. What do they six offsuit? Do you know? Well, hopefully you do. The answer is to fold. And whether you want to jump in and train for five minutes or five hours, the clear the chart quiz is the key to mastering good, fundamentally sound preflop ranges. The beta version of clear the charts is available right now on pokercoaching.com, on our website, and also in the Android and iPhone apps. Also, in poker coaching, we have over 750 classes available for premium members. Whatever you want to ask on poker coaching, how do you play bluffs on the river? When should you check or raise a turn? Whatever. Type it in the search box. It'll probably come up. And if the answer to this does not come up, well, send us an email. Let us know. We'll make a video for you. Also, premium members have exclusive access to the new How to Bink Poker Tournaments course with Rampage Poker. Rampage has been binking tournaments left and right in this course. He studies with literally one of the best poker players in the world, Brock Wilson. And believe it or not, after the first tournament he played, after a decent amount of coaching, he won the tournament. Probably a little bit lucky, but hey, he went from not winning tournaments and being on one of the worst downswings of his life to winning the tournament. That's lucky. You essentially get to watch these two players studying how to go about crushing the game today. Also, premium members get access to this incredibly exploitative course from WSOP main event final tableist Aram Zobian, who's also been absolutely crushing it. It's how to crush and run deep in large field tournaments. He goes through lots of hands that he has played in big, soft, main event type scenarios where the opponents make egregious blunders. He talks about when you should be running insanely big bluffs. He talks about whenever you should be running, well, insanely big folds, like folding a set. Not even that's a big fold of the set. Maybe a ROM folds flushes in that spot. I don't know. You have to go through the course and find out for yourself. If you join Poker Coaching Premium right now during our summer sale, you'll also get complete access to our advanced tournament course. This normally sells for $997. You will get access to it for free. It is included. Content is from Brock Wilson, Super Crusher, Jonathan Jaffe, who just won the Alpha 8 tournament for one and a half million bucks. Little old me, Justin Saliba, Super Crusher extraordinaire. Matt Affleck, he's been around forever, grinding it out, and Rampage Poker. You can check it out right now at pokercoaching.com summer. Bonus number two if you sign up. 
for our summer sale. I coached a small group of students twice a month for five years. I don't know if you all know this. Not a guy who popped up on YouTube last week. I've been around for quite a while. I've been teaching people to crush poker for many, many years. And we did these group sessions with small groups every other week for five years. It's over 240 hours of live group coaching where essentially I let people talk to me for like 20 or 30 minutes about whatever problems they have. And a lot of these people are going to have problems that are very similar to the problems that you have. These videos are not for sale, but if you join Poker Coaching Premium during our summer sale, you will get free access to them for as long as you remain a premium member. Also, if you sign up for Poker Coaching Premium, we'll just give you a Poker Go membership for free. It's included. I like Poker Go. I study a lot by watching a lot of the best players in the world play on Poker Go. They have a lot of good, fun, educational content. And I think they do a very good job. So that is it. This is our summer sale. Here's the pricing we have available. You can check it out at pokercoaching.com slash summer. If you have any questions, comments, feedback, whatever, feel free to email support at pokercoaching.com. You typed in an essay about a hand history. I'm not going to read the essay about the hand history. Is it worth it to call when you think you're going to win 0.1% of the time? If you're getting, uh, what, 999 to 1 pot odds, you should probably call in that scenario. You have a nice announcer voice. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. If you uh, cannot afford poker coaching, well, that's unfortunate. Sign up, however, and if you don't like it, within 30 days, send us an email. Say you don't like it. We'll give you all of your money back. We'll give you literally all of your money back if you do not think poker coaching adds a lot of value to your game. In the ideal world, you make far more money than the price of the membership. I am a big fan of win-wins. I help you get better. Hopefully, you'll be happy to give me a little bit of the money. You need to get better at knowing when to not use GTO against idiotic players. Yeah, you do. You make a lot of money whenever you maximally exploit your opponents. It's very important to know how to play good, strong, fundamentally sound poker, but it's also important to know how to adjust away from it so that you can really crush your opponents. I mean, I discussed this in my first tournament book that I wrote many years ago. You win money by taking advantage of your opponent's mistakes. Simple as that. That is how you win a ton. Okay? We're going to have a lifetime membership deal. I do not think so. You say uh, you played the Clear the Chart feature recently. You've never felt so savvy and stupid. <laughs> it's really helped you in your tournament play. Good. You made day two on the last two out of four multi-day tournaments. Cool. Good luck. Good luck. I mean, good job. Good work. Man, my brain's broken today. It's hard to read and type. Free premium membership, 1.5 big blind per hour win rate. Post premium membership, 12.5 big blind per hour win rate. That's exactly what we are going for. Michael said you cashed the main event this year. There you go. Good job, good work. I did not cash the main event this year. I busted on day three. They got in the money on day four. I don't even remember how I lost. Oh, I remember how I lost. I got, I like had a medium stack and I just lost two flips in a row. My last flip, maybe I shouldn't have taken it. Here's a good example of a spot. I raised ace 10 suited from the cutoff and one of the few players, loose, splashy, aggressive, battling opponent, three bet from the small blind. Maybe we could have called preflop. I thought he was going to fold a lot preflop if I shoved for my 30 big blind stack. So I put it in for 30 big blinds. He snap called me. The king queen offsuit. So I got an ace-10 suited against king-queen for, you know, nice 60 big blind pot. But when I could probably hang out, you know, have make make a run, instead I just lost. What a noob. Can't even cash the main event. Indeed, tough game. What a noob. Everyone cashes the main event. Matthew, I don't even know what you're saying with this hand history. Can you download all the content? No. Fortunately, you cannot. Maybe there's a way. I don't know. Send us an email, support at pokercoaching.com. That's going to be it for today. I hope you all learned a lot in this webinar. To recap, I want to make it really clear. This is a spot that comes up a lot. I try to give you content that is good, concise, and actionable, which is exactly what I do on pokercoaching.com. By the way, in the advanced tournament course, it's a lot of 10 to 20 minute long videos on specific topics. And then quizzes afterwards to make sure that you fully understand what you are learning. We're trying to help all of you drastically improve your poker skills. 
And I've not had a great experience at a lot of other training sites, not just poker sites, but training sites in general, where they'll present an hour long video and no questions afterwards and no confirmation that you actually know what you're doing. And a lot of them are boring. And um, I've had a tough time learning that way. And I know a lot of my students have as well. And I've tried to make poker coaching be as hands-on, as implementable, and as concise as I possibly can. Because I realize a lot of your time is limited. I'm not just making content to make content. I'm making content that I think can help all of you improve. So to crush weak passive players, raise more in late position, continuation bets small, more often, with, especially with your bluffs on the flop. And please, please, please stop paying them off on the river. Okay? And if you want to get 70% off pokercoaching.com right now, head over to pokercoaching.com slash summer. Get in there, study up. It's hot outside. You might as well stay inside and study poker. Thank you for being here. Good luck in your games. Have fun. Make the most of your opportunities. I'm going to be away for the next few weeks. Going up to state with my family for a little bit of a vacation. Would you believe I get to take a vacation every once in a while? My wife demands it. Once a year, I have to leave the computer. I have to leave the computer for at least a few days. That said, I will be back Monday morning, bright and early, 9 a.m. Eastern time, for another episode of A Little Coffee here on YouTube. We have a lot of YouTube videos that come out, I don't know, four or five times a week. I try to keep you all educated and entertained. Hopefully you appreciate it. If you appreciate it, click the like and subscribe button down below. Tell your friends. And if you want lots more content, head over to pokercoaching.com slash summer. Thanks for being here. I appreciate you very much. And I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.